Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and tomorrow, January 5th, is National Bird Day, which I guess is a thing. So to celebrate that, I'm looking at The Birds, released in 1963 by director Alfred Hitchcock, one of the most influential filmmakers of all time. This is our first time with Hitch on this channel, and I just want to stress how monumental this dude was to the world of film. Consider, for instance, that The Birds was his follow-up to the massively successful and seminal Psycho, which had come out three years Years earlier. Now, the three-year gap in between Psycho and the Birds was the longest time Hitch had gone without making a movie since he began his career in 1922. Dude made a movie almost every year, sometimes twice a year, for nearly four decades straight. What the fuck? The Birds is based on a novella by Daphne du Maurier and tells a pretty simple story about an avian assault on the tiny town of Bodega Bay, California. While it can be a little slow at times, it's got enjoyable, stage-worthy performances by everyone in the cast including Tippi Hedren in her first ever film role and a 13-year-old Veronica Cartwright, who would go on to play Lambert in Alien. The scenes featuring bird attacks are unforgettable, thanks to a combination of kick-ass special effects by Ub Iwerks and some very well-trained birds courtesy of head bird handler Ray Berwick. How many bodies did Berwick's birdie bastards bring down in Bodega Bay? Let's find out and bit to them. Wait a minute. The movie begins with its opening credits playing over flappy squawky bird sounds, previewing the fact that The Birds features absolutely no score or non-diegetic music. Instead, it uses silence and sound design to great effect, as you can hear right off the bat. In San Francisco, socialite Melanie Daniels, played by the breathtakingly beautiful Tippi Hedren, walks into a pet shop frequented by dog-walking directors who would grow to be possessive of her. Seriously, I love his movies, but Hitchcock's obsession with Tippi Hedren was real creepy and troubling. Melanie is there to pick up some minor birds, and maybe some of them cheese it looking things in the back there. Mmm, get the extra toasty kind. While the store owner is in the back, this dude with a chin made out of bricks walks in and asks Melanie for help, supposedly mistaking her for a worker there. Clear Clearly she likes the work of this dude's face mason, so she pretends to work there and tries to help him. He's looking for some lovebirds to buy as a birthday gift for his little sister, but it turns out he also knows Melanie doesn't work there, and he's purposefully embarrassing her by sussing out her avian ignorance. No, those are, uh, redbirds. Oh, I thought they were strawberry finches. Oh yes, we call them that too. See, this dude, Mitch Brenner, is a lawyer who recognizes Melanie from a time she was in court. Don't you remember one of your practical jokes that resulted in the smashing of a plate glass window? I didn't break that window. Yes, but your little prank did. I'm not sure what kind of viral pranks Melanie Daniels has been up to, but she's miffed at Mitch for making an ass out of her, so after he leaves, she plans to get back at him by getting the lovebirds he was looking for? Wait, that's not a prank, that's a favor. Melanie Daniels is one of my favorite characters ever, mostly because of how crafty she is. She gets Mitch's name and address by jotting down his license plate and having her well-connected family pull strings at the DMV. The next day, she's got a pair of lovebirds and tries to drop them off at his apartment. Until until a very trusting neighbor of his tells her that Mitch is actually gone for the weekend, up in Bodega Bay, 60 miles north. Cut to Melanie Daniels driving through a postcard on her way to Bodega Bay, the lovebirds swaying with her every turn in some hilarious shots that are a great example of Hitchcock's sense of humor. And if the shots of Melanie driving on the coast look familiar to you, it's probably because this was the same place they used in the opening of I Know What You Did Last Summer. Don't hit no crazy fisherman, Tippy. Now, although some backplates and establishing shots were filmed in both the actual Bodega Bay and the nearby, much smaller community of Bodega, California, most of the birds was actually shot on set at Universal Studios, because Hitchcock preferred the control it gave him. They do a great job hiding it, though. Like in that opening shot, it begins on location and then seamlessly transitions into an on-set shoot. Man, I love filmmaking. Another very trusting dude, the Bodega Bay Postmaster, not only tells this out-of-town stranger exactly where Mitch Brenner lives, but also where the town school teacher lives. Melanie visits the teacher, Annie Hayworth, so she can get the name of Mitch's young younger sister to put on a birthday card to go with the lovebirds. During their conversation, we learn that Mitch's sister's name is Kathy, and that Annie here has a history with Mitch, lending an interesting edge to the conversation between these ladies. Oh, pretty. What are they? Lovebirds. I see. Good luck, Miss Daniels. Thank you. 
Melanie doesn't want to take the road to Mitch's place since it goes straight to their front door. So, insistent on surprising him, she rents a motorboat and takes the lovebirds to cross the bay and land in his backyard instead. Can you believe the backgrounds here are matte paintings? Yeah, that town's a frickin' painting done by Albert Whitlock. Great stuff. In a lengthy scene full of POV shots and not a single word of dialogue, Melanie watches from her boat as Mitch goes into a barn. While he's in there, she quickly docks and just walks straight the fuck into their house to drop off the birds and a birthday card for Kathy. Like, like I always say, it's not a good prank if it don't involve B&E. She gets back out to the boat and watches from afar as Mitch goes inside. When he comes back out with binoculars, he sees her making her escape, so he hops in his car and speed racers back to town, beating Melanie there before she can dock. As her boat approaches, she puts on a perfect what could ever so be the matter face, only to have it ruined by the film's first bird attack. The gall of that gall. Mitch helps her out and finds that the attack has left her bleeding, so he takes her to the nearby Tides restaurant and cleans up her wound. When he asks her what she's doing there. Melanie lies and says that she only brought the birds because she was already coming up to Bodega Bay to visit a friend. Who's your friend? Annie Haywood. The school teacher. Oh, bold strategy, Melanie. Let's see if it pays off for you. The two of them get right back to sexily sparring with one another, and while Melanie is telling Mitch how much she loathes him, his mama walks in, and Lydia Brenner immediately regards Melanie with a suspicion usually reserved for a call from an unknown number. Mitch makes a power move and invites Melanie over to dinner that night, so it looks like Melanie's got a date tonight. Ooh. That means Melanie needs a Bodega Bay base, and lucky for her, Annie Hayworth just so happens to have a room for rent. The school teacher reluctantly lets Melanie stay with her, while the movie reminds us of its title. That's right, it's called The Birds. I thought it was called Classy Sexy Love Triangle. That night, Melanie heads to the Brenner house and meets Mitch's sister Kathy Brenner, who takes a real liking to Melanie because of the lovebirds she brought. So much of a liking, in fact, that she invites Melanie to her birthday party the next day. Later, Melanie admits to Mitch that she lied about knowing Annie in another conversation where the two of them teeter-totter between wanting to slap and wanting to kiss the other one's face. Melanie returns to Annie's, where they chat over a healthy pour of brandy. Annie admits that she and Mitch had a thing four years ago that ended because Mama Lydia was too clingy to her special boy. Annie says she's okay being just friends with Mitch right now, but while Melanie talks on the phone with him, it doesn't take a body language expert to see that's not true. Just keep it together, Annie. Hold yourself together, girl! Mitch is calling to apologize for being oafish and also to invite Melanie to Kathy's party, but she only agrees to go after discussing it with Annie. Never mind, Lydia. Do you want to go? Yes. Then go. Thank you, Annie. Whoa, what was that? A bird? What the fuck is a- Oh yeah, this movie's called The Birds. I keep forgetting. It's time for a bangin' Bodega Bay Brenner birthday party. And while Melanie and Mitch drink more hard liquor, this time in front of a very obvious backdrop on a very obvious set, the two of them finally let on that they like each other. Which Annie is just, yeah, she's so happy for you guys, really. Oh, and Lydia is too, seriously, so happy. We're 52 minutes into this thing, so let's get some goddamn birds up in this bitch. Bring the beaks, Hitchy, my boy! A flock of seagulls attacks the kids, pinning some of them down and causing others to run so far away. But Mitch fights back and the adults get all the kids inside, so no kills just yet. Although the birds have definitely established a pattern now. That makes three times. Mitch has Melanie over for dinner again, and before a conversation can even get going, Melanie notices a bird by the fireplace. Mitch. Too late bird attack! This is one of many memorable bird attack scenes, with really great special effects work for 1963. Like I mentioned, the effects were done by Ub Iwerks, an animator at Disney who, no joke, created Mickey Mouse. Like, he designed that character. Mickey fucking Mouse. For these bird effects, he used some kind of super smart photochemical technique that I don't fully understand, but it involved shooting birds and other subjects against a background lit with a yellow light, with two different kinds of film in the camera, whose shots would then be composited together. It was called yellow screening, so let's just go with that. And fun fact, they only had to use it in this scene after the strawberry finches they loaded inside the chimney wouldn't come out and fly around like they wanted. The actors are actually batting at thin air here. Again, great effects for the pre-computer age. The Brenners have Deputy Al Malone come over, and he's not a very helpful guy. That's a sparrow, all right. We know what it is, Al. Well, what do you want me to do, Mitch? Arrest all the birds? Can't arrest all the birds. That's crazy. Melanie decides that with things so hectic, she might as well stay the night. And Lydia's so excited again. Yes, love it, great. The next morning, Lydia drives over to a farmer friend's house and just walks straight the fuck in, because I guess that's how people do in Bodega Bay. She quickly discovers that he's had the same bird problem they did, only his was a bit worse since it uh, left him dead there. 
Yeah, that's how the movie did that push it, without any sound or music. Isn't that crazy? I kind of love it. I also love that we finally got a kill, even though it took a whole damn hour. Lydia flees the house and hightails it down the road to get back home and dramatically push past her son. Damn, that lady's freakout lasted so long it had a friggin' commute. Melanie agrees to help take care of Lydia, which is maybe why her and Mitch have all of a sudden advanced their relationship to first base. You know, depending on your definition of the bases. There's no universal agreement about them. Lydia finally begins to open up to Melanie, and then asks her to go check on Kathy at the schoolhouse. Wow, Melanie, you got drafted into doing Brenner family errands real damn fast. Melanie gets to the schoolhouse for another infamous scene, made memorable because of the diegetic folk tune, Rissledy Rosseldy, sung by the school children, which goes on for fucking ever. Rissledy Rosseldy, hey Johnny Dosseldy, rest in quality, Rissledy Rosseldy, now, now, now. Seriously, they sing it for three and a half minutes straight, and although it's kind of annoying, it's also a perfectly incongruent backing for the masterfully suspenseful shots of crows accumulating on the schoolhouse playground equipment. This little scene ends after a torturously long shot of Melanie that doesn't let us see how much danger she's in, until she finally looks up and we get a legit scary shot that reveals exactly how big this murder of crows has become. Melanie goes inside and tells Annie what everybody knows, that the bird is the word. So Annie formulates a plan to get her kids out of there safely. Miss Daniels would like to see how we conduct ourselves during a fire drill. <laughs> what the hell kind of reaction is that, kids? Fire drills are awesome. They get you out of class. We're going out of school now. What the hell kind of weirdo kids are these? The bird attack begins awesomely with us only hearing the kids start to run, which awakens these birds with a jump cut. That brings us to another unforgettable scene, as we watch this class of school children get attacked and pecked at by a bunch of birdie bastards on their backs. For those shots, they actually tied real birds to the collars of these kids' clothes, and for the swooping attacks, they put bird seed in the kids' hair. It makes for a truly terrifying scene. Like, that kid got it in the face. And what you doing there, little boy? That pole ain't gonna save you. Oh, and one last behind-the-scenes fact here, a lot of the effects were done by having the kids run on a giant treadmill in front of that yellow screen technique. So these kids, along with Tippy Hadron and Suzanne Pleshett are all running in place for a lot of these shots. During the attack, Kathy Brenner proves herself a hero by helping one particularly unfortunate peer off the ground. The two of them and Melanie are able to hop into an unlocked car and wait there until the attack subsides. At the Tides restaurant, Melanie calls her dad and tells him about the bird attack, even though she's not keen on the specifics of the species. Well, I don't know, Daddy. Is there a difference between crows and blackbirds? That is very definitely a difference, miss. That lady is an ornithologist, and she's one of more than half a dozen characters in this diner who play out a very theatrical scene as they discuss the recent bird attacks. It's a great ensemble discussion that includes Harbingers of Doom, It's the end of the world! Grizzled old sea captains, Oh, flock of gulls nearly capsized one of my boats, practically tore the skipper's arm off. And commentary on humanity versus nature. Birds are not aggressive creatures, miss. They bring beauty into the world. It is mankind's Sam, right. three southern fried chicken. There's also a cook played by Dallas McKennan, the guy who voiced Gumby, but my favorite dude is probably this businessman looking to get midday drunk. Scotch light on the water. Even better is when a scared mother and her children want to leave, and he agrees to drive them home, just after he slams that scotch. You know, for the road. Melanie hears some squawking and looks out the window to witness a seagull dive bomb a dude filling up his car at the gas station. People rush out to help him, and I'm not gonna put him on the count because I don't think he's dead. But don't you worry, the gas from his hose is leaking across the road and over to a car where my favorite drunk businessman is following up that scotch chug with a cigar. Melanie and the others try to warn him, but it's too late. <laughs> Oh my god, that dude just got fucking incinerated! What do I always say, man? Smoking kills. In a series of inadvertently hilarious shots, Melanie follows the fire as it trails back to the gas station and causes an awesome giant explosion, the effects of which can be seen from the sky in one of the coolest shots of this movie. Because, get this, half of that shot is another painting by Al Whitlock. They shot all the action with people running around at the Universal lot, and then used a painting to create the town of Bodega Bay around it. Furthermore, the seagulls that begin to swoop in here were shot separately and added later in post. Because the cameras needed to be above them, they were filmed from a cliff, and the background of that shot was removed by going frame by frame and rotoscoping it out. This movie is seriously a technical wonder, and remember, this was 1963, way before computers could help out with this shit. The swarm of seagulls attacks once more, and during this assault, Melanie finds herself inside a glass cage of emotion! Although a whole bunch of people are getting pecked at here, I don't think any of them get killed, not even the firefighter who just kind of falls in 
and tumbles himself towards the fire. I mean, this guy comes close, but you know what? I've got faith that he'll survive. Mitch rescues Melanie from the phone booth, and they return to the restaurant, where some of the terrified town folk turn on them. They said when you got here, the whole thing started. I think you're the cause of all this. I think you're evil! Evil! Yeah, Mel, you definitely want to shut down that Mrs. Carmody shit before someone winds up getting sacrificed to the birds. The birds retreat, so Mitch and Melanie head over to Annie's house, where Kathy is. But after passing the bully birds on the playground, they get to Annie's and find her body lying lifeless in the front yard. Unlike with the other two nameless victims of this movie, Annie's death is pretty sad, since she seemed like a pretty chill lady and was performed brilliantly by Suzanne Pleshett. R.I.P. girl. Thankfully, Kathy is still okay, and while she, Mitch, and Melanie leave, she sings a tearful song of Annie's heroic deeds. All at once she pushed me inside and they covered her. Annie, she pushed me inside. For some reason, instead of driving back down to San Francisco, Mitch and Melanie decide to bunker down the Brenner house while more birds swarm over town. Although he gets the place in pretty good lockdown condition, eventually they hear the swelling of bird noises outside, which scares everyone and causes Mitch to feed that fire like he's fending off a Krampus. Seagulls break in through the window and even try to peck down the front door in a lengthy home invasion scene that's silent save for the squawking and other bird sound effects. Unfortunately, the this prolonged attack turns Melanie into a shell of the feisty lady we've grown to love, and she winds up stumbling around in a trance like she's Barbara from the original Night of the Living Dead. Oh, and Mitch is nailing stuff against the door just like Ben? The Birds is a goddamn zombie movie, dude! After the lights cut out, the bird noises finally subside, and apparently it stays quiet long enough for everyone but Melanie to fall asleep. But when she hears a rogue fluttering, she heads upstairs to see where it's coming from, and inside a room up there, she makes a terrifying discovery. This is another infamous scene because of both the psycho-style editing and what happened while they were making it. Hitchcock had led Tippi Hedren to believe they'd be using mechanical birds for this scene, but instead, when it came time to shoot it, they ended up throwing real live birds at poor Ms. Hedren's face. It actually took days to shoot, and by the end of it, Tippi Hedren was so messed up that she was put under doctor's care for an entire week, which stalled production a bit. In fact, after Mitch comes to the rescue and drags her unconscious body out of the room, it's a body double he carries down the stairs there, because they had to shoot this while Tippi Hedren was in the hospital. Again, Alfred Hitchcock is one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, but man, he could be a dick to his actors. The attack has left Melanie totally hysterical and swatting at nothing, and when she's done doing that, she just becomes kind of catatonic. I hate Melanie Daniels' character arc. Why we gotta break this badass lady down, dog? Mitch wants to get Melanie to a hospital, but in order to do that, he's gonna have to get through all these birds, including one particularly nasty raven named Archie, who had a real onset rivalry with Mitch's actor Rod Taylor. He went after Rod continuously. <laughs> That's kind of funny, actually. There's a still of me looking terrified with a bandage on and something. That's real terror. That bird, every morning, if I was on the set, we were on the set together, would come over and go, Ang! and bite me. And I hated him, and he hated me. Mitch carefully slinks through these beaked bastards as he goes to the garage and gets Melanie's car ready. It's a great quietly menacing scene as the birds cover every surface in sight and occasionally give Mitch little love bites. But he manages to get the car out of the garage, thankfully not running over any of these bird performers. And for anyone curious, I guess the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was on set the whole time, so hopefully all these birds were alright. Mitch opens a non-existent door that you didn't even realize wasn't there to reveal a pretty scary scene. He and Lydia carry Melanie outside towards the car, although not without some objection. No. No. The movie ends on a fairly ambiguous note. Yeah, Melanie and the Brenners are somewhat safe inside their car, but they're leaving behind a village that's been completely overrun by birds. How many murders did these crows and gulls stir up? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Come on, Garris. You can help me. Birds are smart. Yeah. Yeah. Only three people died in the birds, as far as we could tell on screen. Two of the victims were men, and one was a woman, giving a, you know, a two to one ratio there. And with a runtime of 119 minutes, we had a kill on average every 39.67 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Dan Fawcett, the farmer found with his eyes pecked out. It's actually a horrifying image that was accomplished by combining makeup effects done by Howard Smith with matte painting done in post. Dull machete for lamest hmm. kill will go to Annie Hayworth, who was found dead mere feet from the safety of her home. Damn you birds! And that's it. 
The Birds came out in 1963 and earned Ub Iwerks an Oscar nomination for his effects. I'm glad you joined me for the first kill count of 2019. Stick around, we've got a good year ahead of us. Until next time though, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Bird Kill Count with birds. I really want to thank my good friend Beth B. Rad for providing me her birds to use on the set for this kill count. I love them. This is Garrus and this is Pidgey. And they hang out on her channel at Beth B. Rad on YouTube. Subscribe to that right up there. Fun fact, Beth actually designed the logo that begins every kill count the, the with the blood dripping and everything. That's Beth. She's amazing. She's standing right there. I'm looking at her. Hi, Beth. She's one of my best friends. So go subscribe to her channel. Do it as a favor for me. All right. Thanks, everyone. Be good people and good birds.